So thank you very much to all participants who have joined. Uh, we have uh, our webinar today, which is part of a series, or which is going to come in the coming months. We don't know the dates. And this is about activating the green recovery action plan in Africa through natural capital approaches. Uh, it is going to build on the African Union Green Recovery Action Plan, which sets an ambitious plan, uh, ambition, uh, high ambition for African countries to tackle the combined challenges of COVID-19 and uh, climate change. I want to add the whole issue of also nature loss eh, is linked to, to the two, and we have seen this uh, experience. Eh? The action plan uh, presents critical areas of action in priority sectors such as climate finance, uh, renewable energy, nature-based solutions, resilient agriculture and, uh, agriculture and cities, land use and biodiversity. A number of countries and even multilateral development banks have developed ambitious green recovery plan uh, plans uh, following from the action plan. Uh, WWF has also produced Africa in the context of COVID-19, and it is building forward better policy for the Eastern Africa community. So this is what we, we want to hear from the experts, those people who know. Uh, and some of the things we want to ask is where are these green recovery plans in the different countries in the continent? To what extent have these plans captured or mirrored these key features and recommendations? What are the various support programs available to activate and accelerate the implementation of these green recovery plans? How can uh, a win-win and robust implementation of the various green recovery action plans be ensured to benefit every stakeholder on the African continent? These questions form the trust of this webinar. It is part of a series, as I said earlier, mainstreaming natural uh, capital in Africa's post-COVID-19 development agenda organized by the Joint Implementation Committee of the Natural Capital for Africa Development Finance a program in collaboration with African Union Commission and the UNFCCC Regional Collaboration Center in Kampala. So this is what we have. We have a panel for you of experts uh, and uh, we are going, they are going to take us through this. We are going to have an opening uh, remarks by Dr. Valencia Ushi, who is the manager and acting director African Natural Resource Center and co-chair of the Natural Capital Partnership. Then we'll have three 15-minute sessions by Dr. Mailea Wanabwa, or, who is a senior policy officer and director of sustainable development, uh, the, the, uh, sustainable environment and blue economy African Union Commission. We have another 15 minutes of application of nature-based solutions in Africa by Soraya Moes, who is a regional lead, UNFCCC Regional Collaboration Center, Kampala. And we have another 15 minutes on NDC partnerships, economic advisory support by Margaret uh, Brehai, who is a regional manager, Africa, Anglo and, Lang and uh, Lusophone. NDC partnership support unit, and we have then we'll open up for discussions uh, on the questions and answer by all participants, and we'll have five minutes closing session by John. These are our panelists for today, and uh, at this point, I want to welcome Dr. Valencia Ushie to do the opening remarks for us. Vanessa, you're welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank, thank you so much, Mohammed, and thank you to the partners. So let me give my opening remarks for this webinar. Distinguished speakers, representatives of African governments, development experts, multilateral partners, and delegates from the private sector, academia, and civil society, staff of the African Development Bank, ladies and gentlemen. I'm greatly honored to deliver these remarks at the inaugural webinar of on activating the green recovery action plans in Africa through natural capital approaches. This is the first webinar for the series on mainstreaming natural capital in Africa's post COVID-19 development agenda under the Natural Capital in African Development Finance Program with the acronym NC4ADF. The NC4 ADF program is a joint initiative of the African Development Bank 
and the Green Growth Knowledge Partnership. Launched on the 9th of September, 2021, it aims to mainstream natural capital approaches in Africa's relevant finance architecture. This program comes amid a pivotal, pivotal, pivotal time in world history, particularly in Africa, where countries are struggling to tackle the combined challenges of COVID-19 and climate change. The poverty rate in Africa is significantly rising with harsh economic re realities, especially on women and children. In the African Economic Outlook of the AFDB in 2021, it's estimated that 39 million Africans could fall into extreme poverty by the end of 2021 if appropriate policy support is not provided. In Africa, the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on climate change are diverse and complex. The pandemic is affecting the livelihoods of millions of Africans through agriculture and food systems, national health systems, businesses, education, transport, trade, and public finance. In response to these challenges, the African Union Green Recovery Action Plan provides a regional strategic framework to confront critical priority sectors, especially climate finance, renewable energy, nature-based solutions, resilient agriculture and cities, land use and biodiversity. The African Development Bank has also responded swiftly to the needs of its regional member countries during the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. The bank timely established a $10 billion COVID-19 response facility, which is supporting African countries, governments and businesses to mitigate the social and economic impacts of the pandemic and support a green economic recovery. At the national level, multilateral development banks have developed ambitious green recovery plans consequently. These plans make concrete cases for nature positive investments with recommendations and advice of policymakers which can be incorporated in green recovery plans. Africa with its natural wealth and natural capital residing in its ecosystems, from forests to coral reefs, has much to gain from these tremendous natural assets. For their true value, the share scale of the wealth from Africa's fresh waters and landscapes, its minerals and marine resources has been invisible and overlooked in economic terms. To promote sustainable natural resources in Africa, the AFDB created the African Natural Resources Center in 2013 to provide technical knowledge, policy advice, and investment solutions on natural resources to the bank regional member countries. The center also engages in policy advocacy and dialogue on best practice for natural resource management. Through the African Natural Resources Center and other bank departments on climate change and green growth and the African Development Institute and other arms of the bank, we are increasingly shifting our focus towards green growth and nature sensitive policies through a series of interventions on natural capital and biodiversity conservation. Notable among these is the reason why we're here today, the project or program on mainstreaming natural capital in African development finance. This project is pioneering the integration of natural capital information in the design and financing of the bank's infrastructure projects. It's also building a business case for natural capital among multilateral development banks. It's supporting the integration of natural capital in African countries' sovereign credit ratings. And finally, it's building capacity for the use of natural capital methods in decision making through a natural capital academy. In 2020, the bank created a global community of practice on, on economic policy responses to the COVID-19 pandemic. A key element of this global policy framework is focused on natural capital valuation for more resilient economies. Ladies and gentlemen, the African Development Bank is ready to support the agenda on mainstreaming natural capital in Africa's post-COVID-19 development agenda. In conclusion, I would like to thank the Green Growth Knowledge Partnership, GGKP, the co-chairs of the NC4 ADF program, and our partners, the African Union Commission, the Worldwide Fund for Nature, WWF, for partnering with AFDB to organize this important inaugural webinar. We look forward eagerly to the outcomes of this webinar, which will be very informative for our work under the NC4 ADF program and going forward to support a just and green recovery 
to the COVID-19 pandemic in Africa. I wish you all fruitful deliberations. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Felessa. I think you have set out the important things. I have heard today something from forest to coral reefs. That, that's a new one for me. Thank you very much for setting out the, the, the agenda very right for us. Next on our line I, is, uh, we will have presentation of African Union uh, Green Recovery Action Plan and the country plans by Lea Namabwa. Lea Le Namabwa is a senior policy officer, Secretary of Sustainable Environment and Blue Economy, the African Union Commission. Uh, Lea, you I don't know if I'm audible because I kind of lost the speaker. Yes, yes, you you are. Leah, go ahead. Uh, but I need Jimmy to stop sharing his screen. Jimmy, stop sharing your, your screen. OK, so thank you, uh, moderator. And just also thank my fellow panelists or protocols of that. Um, so greetings from the AUC. I'm going to have a short presentation on the AU Green Recovery Action Plan, which we uh, in short call the AU GRAP. Uh, so this uh, action plan was developed in pace uh, during 2020. Uh, mainly it started as an idea to have a webinar actually, uh, but then there was call for support and everyone said, no, no, we don't want more webinars, we want action plans and things which you can implement after these webinars. So that's how, how the idea started. And um, mainly we looked at the existing vulnerabilities, especially food insecurity and debt, which was rising during the, uh, each month that passed uh, between 2020 and at the time we we're launching this document, these vulnerabilities increased, food security increased, our debts increased because suddenly governments had to borrow to be able to implement most of the urgent uh, or priorities in their countries. Uh, the other reason behind it was the development, uh, progress on achieving uh, the Agenda 2063, the SDGs and Paris Agreement. We were already not on track to meeting any of this, but then with the pandemic, we moved back as the priorities changed, of course, to be from these to, meaning, to dealing with the emergencies of health. So of course, it naturally the health sectors uh, had uh, more, of funded, uh, more funding and prioritization. Uh, of course, the health is, um, is one of the SDGs, but yeah, this was specific to the pandemic and more like uh, emergency response. Um, again, like poverty increased and all these other things which were already not on track, but got worse. Um, we all know environmental issues are not priorities for most governments. So with the pandemic, this also moved further down the line, the Paris Agreement, et cetera. The other issue we looked at was the planetary emergency. There was sudden urgency to address climate change, biodiversity loss, and more broad environmental degradation. These were claimed as, a, has been described as our planetary emergencies. And um, so we thought, okay, during that time, let's develop an action plan and see which of these urgent issues could be more urgent than others, if you want to call it that. Uh, during the pandemic, we also realized that women were more impacted than men, uh, since they already had the extra burdens of uh, looking after families, for example, and being at home. And now with the schools closed, they had, and everyone staying at home, they had extra work to now look after the extra people who are now at home and not moving out. Um, there was a full report by UNDP on that. So it would be, we based most of the, uh, of the document from the findings from this research. Um, so we decided to come up with a blueprint for action. We knew that they did not, we did not have to start from zero. We already have these plans at country level. Countries already have um, either action plans for achieving Agenda 2060 or the SDGs or the Paris Agreement. We're not starting from zero. So we would build on those existing national and sectoral master plans, as well as continental ones to uh, further in, uh, develop the action plan for the, the green recovery. Uh, only difference is now we're adding the green part of it, ensuring that those existing plans for development were resilient to not just climate issues, et cetera, and environmental degradation, but also resilient to pandemics um, and also 
yeah, make them a little bit greener because we realize that the environment is at the center of everything we do. Uh, when one side collapses, then we are all stuck uh, in the middle. Uh, so the priorities, we chose actions that address the combined challenges, not just from the COVID recovery, COVID-19 recovery, uh, but also climate change. And then we focus on critical areas which could be of joint priority. So that's in general, or a little bit of the background on how or the how the process started and how we progressed on the development of the uh, green recovery action plan. So, being a political institution, of course, it took a whole year to get it launched. Uh, so we were able to finally launch the action plan in July, on 15th of July this year, and the event was attended by some heads of states, ministers. Uh, representatives from different organizations uh, here present, or including the ones here present today. And um, so Lea, we- Lea, could you, could you repeat, uh, use the presentation mode for your slides? Ah, okay, from my side, it shows like it's a presentation mode. Okay. I don't know what view you have on that side. Let me stop and then restart. Is it now on presentation mode? Mr. Mohammed? No. No. It's still slide. Oh, shoot. Um, I'm not sure what to do because I'm getting to the bottom here. This should be presentation mode. Yes, yes. That is a presentation mode. And now? Uh, okay. No. Let's, let, let's continue. Maybe there's some, some technical problem. You can just continue there. It's okay. Uh, probably the technical challenge is on my side. Wait, wait. I'll make one more. I could just go, because now I know what I'm seeing. Is it? Now it's not, I guess. No, now it's not. Okay. Um, I guess we could go as uh, it is. Okay, some people have it as a presentation mode. Eh? There's somebody who said uh, she has as presentation mode. Eh? The participants, so go ahead. I think it's okay. You can do it. The participants can see it. Eh? That is the more important one. So is it now in presentation or slide mode? Now it is a slide mode, but you can do the presentation. I think the, somebody from the uh, uh, viewer said they are seeing, okay. Okay. And anyway, from my side, it's showing presentation mode. Uh, I guess it's something with my settings, but um, so I'm, I'm on a slide which has the, the launch uh, of the action plan. And um, so we say the aim is to support Africa's sustainable recovery from COVID-19 while realizing the goals of a shared vision for a prosperous, secure, and inclu inclusive and innovative future. Um, I just check if I have received a, okay, no guidelines on how to change it. So we have um, five priority areas and interventions. The first one is on climate finance, and here we focus on increasing flows, efficiency, and impact. Then we have renewable energy, and support, this focuses on supporting renewable energy, energy efficiency, and national just transition programs. The third is on nature-based solutions and biodiversity. And here we are looking at issues of sustainable land management, forestry, oceans, and ecotourism. And the fourth one is on our resilient agriculture which focuses on economic development and green jobs. And the fifth one is on green and resilient cities. And this is with a focus on water and so mainly on flooding and water resources, as well as enhancing information, communication and technology. On the implementation, we have three levels. Here we have the coordination mechanism, the partnerships and resource mobilization, monitoring, reporting and advocacy. 
So on the coordination, the AUC will provide the coordination for the implementation of the action plan through providing strategic guidance and facilitate its domestication. So member states will be encouraged or, and are being encouraged to draw from the action plan to develop their national strategies and identify programs and activities to implement the action plan. The RECs will also be involved in supporting and coordinating the implementation of the action plan at the regional and sub-regional levels. So on the partnerships and resource mobilization, uh, we've approached partners to support through the secondment of staff to support the operationalization and implementation. And I'm happy to report that we do have NDC partnership. Margaret will be speaking later. So she has supported us in this area and we now have two staff uh, an economic advisor and a knowledge management, knowledge management and communication expert who are supporting the, the AU. Uh, then we are also mobilizing financial support. We have got at least one donor who has put money on the table, if you want to call it that. Uh, the Swedish government has offered support for the pillar three, not two, which is on uh, nature-based solutions and biodiversity. Uh, so countries are, are invited to actually contact their the national, the, the missions abroad to, to follow up on that particular support. Um, then we are also following up on discussions to follow up on pledges for support. We have had a few countries actually coming forward and offering support, the, both financially and technically. So we are just in the process of formalizing these agreements and then we'll be happy to report at the next session. We do have a monitoring, reporting, and advocacy section or segment. And this information is going to be part of the five intervention areas where countries will be asked to provide support, I mean, to report on some of the implementation. So it's one of the annexes and it has proposed actions and a column also on the actors involved. So it's not, we, are, we know it's not just the A implementing this. We may have actions being implemented by different partners. And there is a section for that. Um, so the current status, uh, the first, as indicated, we do have staff supporting the action plan. The two people have been seconded to the AU. Their final paperwork is being done, so they are formally AU staff. Uh, we do have on, ongoing consultation sessions uh, on the different pillars with the national and regional stakeholders. Uh, we are trying to get a few signature initiatives to push forward. Um, yeah, this was an old slide ahead of COP26, but now this was carried forward. So this is part of the work that the seconded staff are working on. Uh, support the mainstreaming of AU Green Recovery Action Plan priorities across national COVID-19 recovery plans. We do have um, the fifth action on supporting member states in the application and approval status stages of the climate finance processes. Again, this is one of the carryover actions which um, were moved from, uh, from pre-COP to post-COP, and we continue engagement with partners for resource mobilization. Uh, and with that, I would just like to thank you all for, the, for your kind attention and um, looking forward to a uh, fruitful session. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you very Roger. much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alea, for that great presentation. Uh, since the slides are not moving, there is a request from Tai Teferi, and I, which I believe is shared with by many in participants, to share the pre the presentation of Leah with the participants of this uh, webinar. Uh, San and the organizing team, please uh, organize to 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 make this available to all participants. With that, we, we move to the next presentation on nature-based solutions. Uh, this is going to be done by Soraya Mace, who is the regional lead UNFCWCCC uh, Regional Collaboration Center in Kampala. Uh, Soraya, welcome, and the floor is yours. Hello, Soraya. Go ahead. Hello, everyone. I'm just trying to um, I'm trying to sort out my screen share here. Let, let me try that again. Um, what are you seeing? I think you're we, seeing. We see the first the introductory slide, which is good. 
Oh, you did. Okay, because it's showing it's showing something else. Um, um, let me try that again then. So, so that's okay at the moment. Application You're of the nature based application of nature based solutions in Africa NDC NDC. Sir. Yeah, it's good. Oh well, great. That's <laughs> I'm happy. There we go. Um, so um, my name is Siri Muse. I'm the um, regional lead at the RCC Kampala, um, uh, based here in Uganda and bringing you a warm and sunny welcome um, to all the attendees. I'm really delighted to be here and um, hi, um, Leah and, and Margaret, good co to connect again. Um, also, hello to the rest of the colleagues. Um, in, in, in starting the presentation, just to, to, to be aware that I'm not uh, um, an MBS um, specialist at su as such, but um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm very much in, engaged in the, in the subject. Um, you know, everything around um, protecting, conserving, and restoring um, nature, I think, is something that we can all get behind. And um, we all enjoy healthy ecosystems, biodiversity, clean air, and clean water. So I'm very happy to be speaking on, on the subject. And I think it's also a good follow on uh, what Leah was talking about as well, where um, the NBS forms a, a key part of the Green Recovery Action Plan of the AU. Um, and also we heard about Sweden already uh, funding parts of uh, part of the, the, the pillar on um, MBS. So um, without further ado, let me get into this. Um, so I'm just going to give you some uh, background um, on RCC Kampala. Maybe you're not aware of our institution. Then uh, give a brief overview what nature-based solutions are. Um, then also um, um, give a brief overview of the inclusion of various MBS um, in African NDCs. So we've um, gone through the, the, the various NDCs um, in the region and um, had a look what they have to say about um, NBS. Um, we've just finished COP26, so I think um, it's also worth just mentioning a few outcomes from COP26 in relation to, to NBS. Um, and then wrap up with key challenges and a conclusion. So let me get into that without further ado. We're um, a collaboration between the UNFCCC and the East Africa Development Bank, and we're established back in May 2013 um, by MOU between the two institutions. Um, we cover 19 countries in the Eastern and Southern African region. Um, and then we were originally formed, um, put here in place to support the regional distribution of the clean development mechanism. But since uh, 2015 and the, the ratification of the Paris Agreement, we've also been looking wider um, on, on issues under, under the Paris Agreement like NDCs, MRV related issues, and also climate finance. Um, having said that, um, following the COP26 outcome in Glasgow just now, and the strong outcome on the, the, the UN, um, carbon crediting offset scheme under Article 6, um, we will again be um, supporting very strongly the, the, um, the carbon markets as we were doing when we were originally established to support the clean development mechanism under the Kyoto Protocol. And yeah, we, we are a regional outpost of the Secretariat, so we're able to also support very well um, regional events um, such as Africa Climate Weeks um, or, or other technical workshops that are mandated or done from time to time from Bonn. So just to, to talk a little bit about nature-based solutions, um, I think somehow that um, the, the, the idea of nature-based solutions has been around uh, very long, uh, whereas this, the, this term MBS is, is something a little bit newer. Um, and in fact, if you look to the um, to the, the the UNFCCC documents, you will not see um, precisely this um, um, this terminology, nature-based solutions. Um, if you look in the Paris Agreement, Article 5.1, we have um, um, a call for parties to to take action to conserve and enhance as appropriate sinks and reservoirs of greenhouse greenhouse gases. 
and also to take other actions to, to, to support and implement, um, including through results-based payments, existing frameworks as set out in the convention and so on to reduce emissions from deforestation, forest degradation, and the role that conservation, um, sustainable management of forests and enhancement of forest carbon stocks in developing countries um, and so on. Uh, can play in, in, in meeting the, 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 the objectives of Paris Agreement. So it doesn't say specifically nature-based solutions, but uh, it's, it's a very similar concept. So if you're looking for a definition, we've got to one here um, by the IUCN, um, paste it in. And then um, moving to the, to the diagram, um, I think you can, you can think of... Um, MBS as, a, as an umbrella concept that covers a whole range of ecosystem related approaches, um, all of which address um, certain societal challenges. Um, here in the diagram, for example, food security, climate change, water security, human health, disaster risk reduction, um, social and economic development. So um, taking various ecosystem approaches, um, um, the, these, these challenges can be addressed. Um, And then just to, to, to kind of raise the, the, the importance of, of why nature-based solutions um, are so important. I think um, if you look at uh, our, our global emissions, um, something like a quarter of global greenhouse gas emissions come from the um, Afulu um, sector, the agriculture, forestry, other land use um, sector. So that, that's already um, a, a, a large chunk of the pie, a, a quarter of emissions. Then um, these, you know, um, the 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 um, nature-based solutions we rely on those for for global food security and also job creation, um, and then also you know the the ecosystems play such a key role as as I mentioned at the outset in our um, in in our in our health um, and um, also the the you know that's the human well-being and then the biodiversity benefits as well so then coming a little bit to um the the, the nature-based solutions that we we observe in the ndc's in the region um going through the english language ndc's because um we're we're, we're a little bit under under resourced in, in, in french um here in uganda but uh we, we were basic we were able to identify that um, all the NDCs um, include nature-based solutions in one way or another um, both under the mitigation and the adaptation contribution um, but as already mentioned by um, that um, not necessarily the MBS terminology is used so the same way that the UNFCCC doesn't uh, necessarily use that terminology also the countries um, in the NDCs, don't use that terminology, but it's clear that um, these are nature-based um, solutions. Um, many of the MBS um, have, have a weight to, towards adaptation. So um, you'll see that um, the, 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 those measures are, are skewed or somehow weighted towards adaptation solutions rather than mitigation solutions. But I mean, the, the, um, the, the very you know, the brilliant thing about MBS is that um, they often can have uh, mitigation co-benefits then as well from adaptation. Um, most popular solutions that are observed are around reforestation. So that's uh, foresting on, on um, those areas where there used to be forest, but now has been deforested. So reforesting those areas, afforestation. So um, um, cultivating a forest on lands that was not previously forested, uh, landscape restoration. So, you know, this could be things like um, 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 wetlands, um, mangroves, peatlands, um, grasslands as well, restoring those to, 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 to health and um, sustainable forest management as well. Then to just pick on a couple of countries um, with examples. So um, a big country like Nigeria, They've, they've conducted an analysis on the potential role of MBS in, in, in addressing climate change and, and as, as, as a component of their contribution. 
and they've estimated that uh, they have a potential uh, mitigation, um, but yeah, a mitigation potential per year of 115 um, megatons. Um, and most of the solutions that they are looking to are agroforestry, uh, improve forest management, and also forest restorations. Then to look at a different type of country, the seashells um, facing its own challenges as a small island developing state. Um, it's around um, coastal coastal management. So um, they they've they've putting in place a. to put in place protections, including marine protected areas for at least 50% of their seagrass and um, mangrove ecosystems by 2025, and to up that to 100% of seagrass and mangrove e ecosystems by 2030, and then reaping as well all of the co-benefits that, that, that come with that. Um, to take another example from South Sudan, which again is a, is a very different country, landlocked, and also an LDC that is facing um, quite a number of extreme challenges. Uh, they are looking to an, uh, a rather ambitious uh, reforestation um, project um, to, to plant 20 million trees over a period of 10 years. Um, and also they got looking to declare um, about 20% of its natural forest as reserve forest to protect them from deforestation. Um, then um, for, 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 for an example of a very ambitious goal, we can, we can look to Ethiopia. Um, they, they don't necessarily use the MBS terminology, but they, they've mentioned a number of um, interventions in the in the Lulu CF sector, the land use, land use change and forestry sector, um, which has got significant potential for uh, net emission removals. And they're looking to reforest up to a total of 15 million hectares um, as, as, as a long-term forestry sector goal. And this will increase the forest cover to 30% um, of the national territory by 2030, which is a, um, a significant and ambitious um, goal for Ethiopia. Then turning to the outcomes from COP26, um, which just concluded in Glasgow, um, the, the, the nature-based solutions featured in the presidency's four goals going into COP26. So there was uh, four very prominent goals that the presidency had been um, um, emphasizing um, from for months going into COP26 and uh, MBS had been featured there, uh, particularly um, tree planting and, and biodiversity con conservation. Then on the outcome, you have the link there. Um, paragraph uh, 38 of the Glasgow Climate Pact. Um, it emphasized very strongly the importance of protecting, conserving, and restoring nature and ecosystems to achieve Paris Agreement temperature goals. Um, then I just want to mention as well um, on the sidelines um, that 45 government, governments pledged $4 billion for urgent action and investment to protect nature and shift to more sustainable ways of farming. So this is a bit of an aggregation of, of various pledges from various um, governments and the programs and projects that they have running or that they plan to, to, to get up and running um, to protect um, uh, nature and shift to, to more sustainable ways of farming. Um, and then finally, as, as a kind of standalone announcement that was significant, um, Canada announced that uh, they'd be putting one billion Canadian dollars. Sorry on the acronym there, looks like it's a bit back to front. Uh, in international support for nature-based solutions, um, or otherwise, yeah, that, that can also be considered as, as a fifth of, of their climate finance. And yeah, so so there's kind of what this demonstrates that is there's somehow a, a momentum building, and um, 
um, that that momentum is is also just wider than COP26, um, also in, in COP25 already uh, in, in Madrid two years ago, there was already a clear emerging focus on nature-based solutions. Um, and that COP26 recognized that there is no pathway to net zero without actually protecting and restoring nature and encourage countries at that time to include nature-based solutions in their climate plans, um, which is, has led to a number of initiatives as well since then. Um, the Standing Committee on Finance has come out with um, uh, several nature-based nature -based solution related papers and case studies. And um, coming up in this year, uh, part two of the Standing Committee on Finance Forum on Finance for Nature-Based Solutions is happening. So um, it's part of a wider narrative of, of um, momentum on NBS um, activities. Then um, I can't help mentioning something about Article 6 and, and a link to nature-based solutions. As you might be aware, um, and, and I mentioned it briefly at the outset, RCC Kampala was originally um, established with the aim of supporting the regional distribution of the clean development mechanism. Um, and now that we have the successor mechanism under Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, um, it just bears keeping in mind that um, the link to MBS as well from Article 6. So in case you, you, you were not following in the news, um, COP26 reached finally an agreement on the fundamental norms related to Article 6. So that uh, this was kind of the missing part of the Paris Agreement rulebook that has been missing since the last four years. Um, and now we can move forward with the successor mechanism to the clean development mechanism. Um, and what does that mean for nature-based solutions? Well, um, the, the, the carbon markets can be used also to, to, to support finance-based solutions, particularly where the um, nature-based nature solution um, accounts for the sequestration and, and that can be quantified. Um, that can then also be credited. So these removals, as, as this type of sequestration is considered in, 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 in Article 6 documents, um, uh, are, are part of, of, of Article 6 during the negotiations. Um, there were some parties that were against, um, including uh, removals, but finally what was agreed is that removals are in. So we can expect to see um, afforestation and reforestation type projects and other types of projects that um, restore landscapes. Um, we, 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 you know, for, for an um, idea of what might be coming, uh, you can also so see the... Please wind up, please. Eh? We, we have time problem. Okay, okay. Let, let, let me, let me finish, quickly finish. Um, sorry for that. So um, on, on, on the removals, um, I think we will see that these will take on a more important role as, as all countries, you know, move to a, um, to a net zero um, type position. Um, it's the removals that will really take on greater importance um, for finding other opportunities for, for, for getting to net zero as, 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 as the countries reduce their emissions overall. Um, which I think is a very exciting um, space actually. Um, then just to, to mention a couple of key challenges um, about inadequate funding. Um, it's, it's, it's a small portion only of climate finance that goes to MBS. Um, there's also difficulty in measuring the effectiveness of some MBS um, measures. Um, and then outside, yeah, outside of the forest ecosystems, they're, they're not well represented in the NDCs. And um, yeah, MBS, it's, it's, it's not an easy thing to do, um, uh, particularly as standalone projects, um, it really needs to be part of a um, more integrated and holistic uh, type of approach. So just rushing through those last parts. Um, 
I think despite increasing application, parties still have more potential to increase their mitigation targets and strengthen the resilience of their people drawing on, um, on MBS type solutions. Um, parties need to adopt an ecosystem-wide application of MBS to enhance the effectiveness of the interventions. That's the last point that I made from the previous slide. Um, all the above will be enabled by more awareness raising about the potential various MBS and providing technology to determine such potential. So I hope this quick and rapid um, presentation was uh, contributed at least a little to the awareness raising and I'm sorry for, for going over time. Um, and back to you, Chair, thank you. Thank you very much, Suri. That was very, very helpful. And uh, please also feel free to share documents. The Secretariat, the organizers have promised to share all documents. So where we rushed, we will have that presented. And please feel free to engage with the presenters for more information. With that, we got to the last presenter of this session which is about NDC partnerships, economic advisory support. This is going to be done by Margaret Brehai, okay. who is a regional manager Africa, that is Anglo and Lusophone, NDC partnership support unit of the NDC partnership, NDC partnership. Uh, Margaret, you are welcome. Thank you so much, uh, moderator. Apologies to everyone. I will not show my face, maybe later. Let me uh, ask for someone to upload my presentation, but meanwhile, I can start. Thank you, everyone, and I'm really happy to join. Um, reading from the NDC partnership, um, I, I really connect with the uh, previous speakers and everyone. Uh, this is very great. One, one exciting thing is to see that being the first webinar, but we are all uh, um, appreciating what is already ongoing so that we are able to build on the existing work to avoid uh, duplication. Um, as my uh, presentation comes on board, yeah, I've already been introduced, so I can go to the next slide. Um, I'll give just a brief uh, highlight on what we are as NDC partnership and then I can zoom into our economic advisory initiative in Africa and how we want to move forward. First of all, I shouldn't forget that uh, the NDC partnership is actually hosted by UNFCCC, uh, Mr. Surya, who, is, uh, who has just finished. Uh, we are hosted at global level uh, in Bonn. We have there uh, our global office, and also we are hosted in the region I sit with Surya in Kampala but even in other regions, other regional managers are hosted there. And we are a global uh, initiative, basically formed of countries and institutions. So far we are 195 and AUC is a member uh, as, as an institution. So when Leah was speaking, this is how we connect. They are a member of the partnership. And this was formed way back when the Paris Agreement was formed. And, and it mainly, the, our mandate is to increase alignment, coordination, but most importantly, how do we support countries to access uh, more resources to implement their targets, their NDC commitments? How do we increase the speed? How do we scale up? Next. So this is how we work. And um, I picked a few, but very core instruments that we use to drive climate action at country level and globally. And uh, one of them I will go through quickly because the major one is the third, which is the economic advisory initiative. But our broader engagement with countries is called country engagement. And this is a country driven process where we improve coordination but help countries to assess their work on NDC implementation. What is already ongoing? What are the gaps? And then those gaps, we use them to formulate NDC implementation plans where our members support according to the country's context. So that's a huge, a huge, uh, a huge support we give countries on NDC implementation. Then we have climate action enhancement package. 
this is one way on how we support countries to plan, to review, and raise ambition and implement their targets. And that is the way or uh, it's a, a means of funding. At COP recently, we actually changed the CAP to PAP, that is Partnership Action Fund. It will also still be supporting. It's like a contribution from the partnership on top of our partners where they don't have funds, the partnership uh, support units we support countries directly, but it is just uh, an, ad an addition support. So our third uh, instrument that we started uh, way back a year ago in 2020 is the Economic Advisory Initiative. This is where we are supporting countries to create or to establish climate um, compatible COVID-19 recovery packages, recovery plans. Why we put it in place is because when we were supporting countries in 2020 to do their NDC revision, Immediately, COVID struck, it, everything almost got to a halt. And our co-chairs quickly re, uh, thought through that, how do we bring climate action on the table with COVID? Because the risks of COVID do not actually uh, remove the risks of climate change. So this is an initiative whereby we want countries to table both at the same time. And we saw more resources being diverted from environment to health, to Ministry of Health. So we're looking at the way, how do we bring climate action to actually, to make sure that as the COVID is being uh, tackled, even climate action is there. So this is where we've supported countries to have these analysis and make sure that they can able to tackle both climate action and, and COVID. And, uh, the new one, which we uh, launched at COP, is at COP26, is Greening Central Bank Initiative. This is very new, but it is relating to uh, economic advisory work. We are looking at some of the, the recommendations from economic advisory work to actually be implemented if we in, improve the financial sector, if we can make proper regulations to allow green investment, to even bring in private sector. So those two will be working hand in hand. And those two are all hosted in the Ministry of Finance and Planning. Next. And that uh, I wanted to show you where we are. Globally, we are in 70 countries. But in Africa, 34 countries are our members. And they are already benefiting from NDC implementation. But 17 of them have accessed economic advisory initiative. Next. So we have 17 countries that have accessed econom embedded economic advisors. Depending on what the country wanted, we just uh, supported according to the context. Some countries have two advisors. Some countries have one. Uh, some are uh, economic advisors. Others are finance advisors. But the whole package is about helping countries to assess the impact of COVID across the economy, across the sectors, and identify some of the climate action that could actually be part, be embedded or mainstreamed in the economic recovery plans. But you'll find that some countries have taken advantage of this exercise to even uh, mainstream uh, climate action in their national development plans. So very interestingly, in my next slide, I will show you where we have a few results to show that actually some of the uh, nature-based solutions, nature-based related actions are part of this and are already mainstreamed, but where is the funding? That is also another question. And as we did this at country level, at AUC, as Leah mentioned, they also started this initiative and we found it very, very exciting to see how we can link the country level lessons or experiences to the continental level. So there is going to be a real great experience to see we can analyze regionally how uh, COVID, how greening economies is going to be at, at Africa level. And some of our partners that are supporting this, already Sweden has been mentioned. In fact, that is a real target as a partner who is looking at NBS in particular. But we have government of UK, Netherlands, Belgium, 
Germany, GIZ, and BMZ. And we have Triple GI, World Bank, UN Habitats, and others are coming on board to see how do they support countries to come up with mid and long term recovery plans. And so far, we have three countries that have uh, completed and, and economic advisors have gone, but they are even asking for extension of their contract so that some work can continue. Next. So we have Liberia, uh, Eswatini, and, and Burkina Faso. But I picked two countries, which I wanted to show you uh, some of the key areas that are coming out in countries and see how even nature-based solutions are already in the process of being mainstreamed. But how do we make to work together to scale up? So for example, the Liberia Economic Advisory, they did, after doing that whole massive uh, COVID impact assessment on the economy, at the end of the day, they managed to get more than 50 uh, projects, uh, climate actions, and they have aligned them, posted them, aligned them within the economic recovery plan. So as government is mobilizing resources, it is actually handling both COVID impacts and also uh, climate action. Very interestingly is that at the beginning you could find that uh, the economic recovery would be looking at only health and, and employment measures. But right now, most of the uh, economic recovery plans have other sectors, water, agriculture. They actually realize how interrelated these are. And in Liberia, one other thing uh, the economic advisor recommended is that if it would be good for Ministry of Finance to have a climate change unit to be part of that, just for country uh, strengthening, but also owning and maintaining and uh, sustaining the work. And uh, in Swatini, we also find a similar kind of level of mainstreaming climate action across their economic recovery. But one unique thing here, the economic uh, advisor went ahead and helped the government to build on existing projects, but make them better. Uh, one is on eco industrial parks, then there is uh, liquefied petroleum gas. Another one was on 10% ethanol uh, fuel blending project. They were there, they, they, it's not like they are new, but this economic advisor put them in an attractive way that as we talk, uh, the discussions with Africa Development Bank and UNIDO, they might take them to another level for funding. And then there was one cross-cutting issue that came out of the COVID work, that is climate financing. All, most economic advisors have supported government to start looking at innovative climate financing to complement what is already there. Uh, we've seen some countries already requesting the NDC partnership on making some assessments to explore innovative climate financing uh, uh, mechanisms like green bonds, like even Article 6 that has come up. Countries want to assess how they can explore to benefit from the carbon market approaches. Next. So with those few words, I just wanted to show that as the partnership moving forward 2025 and, and beyond, we are still going to continue with NDC implementation, but we are looking at many mechanisms of economic recovery to make sure climate action is there, but also uh, greening financing sector and would like to call upon our partners on NBS. Let's work together, build on what we have, like the 17 countries we have already with these plans, they are going to be informing the Africa Union uh, Climate Action Plan because those economic advisors will be building from those, drawing lessons and making some uh, regional analysis to see where funding should flow. And I see us, if we can work together, we can actually make more funding flow to NBS uh, components, which have not been actually brought to table the way it deserves. So with that, really, I, I, I appreciate this and I'm willing to answer more questions. Thank you so much. Back to you, Mohan. Thank you very much, Margaret. That's much uh, appreciated. And now that brings us to the end of the formal presentations. 
and I want to open up for questions and answer. Let us start with uh, what is on the chat. And uh, there was a question for Dr. Vanessa. Please kindly elaborate how strategic plans in Africa are monitored and aligned with the distribution of resources within the human social security numbering for effective determination of impacts on the ground. I know Vanessa has left the meeting. Can I request any of the panelists if you can respond to that particular question uh, about the elaboration of the strategic plans and how these are monitored and aligned with the distribution of resources? Is there somebody who can take that or do we go to the next question? Panelists? I think as it's bank specific on the distribution of resources, it would be better if someone from the AFDB, if any, are still on to respond to that. Okay, we, we pass that. Let's go to the next one, which is for Leah. Would you please indicate the line between AU Green Recovery Action Plan and the Green Stimulus Program? Leah, over to you. Uh, thank you, WWF, for that question. Uh, the two documents are different. One is an action plan, and the other is a, a list of programs and in, initiatives which could be implemented um, the one, of, of course, is led by the AU and another, I guess, by the AMSEN Secretariat. So, but in, in, um, in principle, one is an action plan and the other is a program. I think this is what I can say for now. Uh, thank you very much, Leah. I mean, it's clear. Maybe most of the programs are also driven from the action plan. So the programs, uh, the stimulus program is one of the programs that respond to the different uh, actions plans. That's I, I think what I hear. And then we we have two questions for Suri. Can we get examples and difference between nature-based adaptation and nature-based mitigation solutions? And uh, you can you can combine the two questions. And the second one is that there's the nature-based solution finance require a separate, separate pathway from climate finance. Over to you, Suri. Thanks, Mohammed. Um, and I, I hear you're a bit of an expert on, on, on MBS, so, so feel free to, to, to supplement. Um, I would say that a, a, a lot of it comes down even just to the framing by, by the host party. So they may put this mitigation um, they may, may put the, the measure under, under mitigation section, or they may put the measure under the adaptation section of the NDC, um, depending what they perceive, you know, is, is, is the greater benefit somehow, um, which is sometimes even done um, um, for political reasons, the, the, the placing of those measures. But I would say, um, uh, if I could, if I can name some examples, like maybe something that has greater adaptation benefit would be um, a riparian uh, tree planting. So tree planting along uh, rivers and water waterways and so on, um, which which would have a, a great adaptation benefit um, in controlling flooding or you know um, controlling erosion. Um, but of course, those those trees would also have a mitigation benefit, but might. Be primarily be doing done as, as an adaptation measure, um, or another another example could be um, mangrove restoration um, to 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 build resilience against um, storm surges. So that's a, could be considered more of an adaptation um, measure, while it, it will have um, biodiversity and mitigation co benefits as well. Um, on the other hand, something that you might um, categorize more as a, as a mitigation um, measure would be, um, I'd say mon monoculture uh, tree plantations, which um, their primary uh, benefit would then be mitigation because it would have few uh, or, or little biodiversity um, benefits or, or adaptation benefits. Um, yeah, so I hope that answers the question, but if Mohammed, you feel like you'd like to add anything, go ahead. Otherwise I'll, I'll continue. Um, with with the next um, question, um, should I do that? 
Sure, go ahead, please. Okay, so um, the the next question was about does the MBS uh, finance require a separate pathway from climate finance? And I would say that it's um, maybe not as simple as this. Um, I think there, there, there are many pathways and um, climate finance is not, uh, doesn't, doesn't really have a definition per se. So I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't see like a clear separation between the, the, um, the, the various pathways. Um, I think it's, um, yeah, if, 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 if I can leave it there, thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, I think what we get from Suri is that uh, the, the most important thing is not the categorization into adaptation or mitigation, but the whole framing of does it lead to gain in for climate change? Does it lead to change to biodiversity? And does it create opportunities to manage societal problems? Uh, so if we get those three uh, issues right, where they come together, it becomes a nature-based solution. So, and it could be the case that some adaptation initial interventions might also provide mitigation solutions. So, uh, so, I mean, the most important thing is the really the approaches that we use and the expected goal. Most importantly, nature-based solution is not a goal in itself. It contributes to other goals. And this is what Suri explained in his uh, presentation that, you know, the, the goals are driven from climate uh, change uh, uh, targets, from biodiversity targets and from society uh, targets. So those are the goals and nature-based solutions just a mechanism to achieve those goals or make a contribution to, the, to those goals. I think that that is well taken. And then the question for Margaret, I'm sure you also see on the screen is what criteria was used in choosing the three African countries or three countries, Liberia, Estawe, Eswatini, and Burkina Faso for implementation of the economic recovery plan with advisors. Uh, over to you, Margaret. Uh, okay, thank you so much. Um, actually, in total, there are 17 countries in Africa that have benefited uh, with economic advisors. Uh, the criteria is uh, as simple. It's the countries that request for support. So it's country initiated. And why I mentioned the three countries, uh, they will run the first round. Most of the advisors have been deployed eight to 12 months. So the first round of support is the uh, Liberia and Eswatini and Burkina Faso is done. And that's why we have the few details to show how the work and how countries are taking on. Although like Eswatini has actually asked for an extension of that uh, bond consultant, and I think he's, they are going to get an extension to take on completely uh, those projects. Thank you. Thank you very much, Margaret. I see. Margaret, have you finished answering that question or you want to continue? Yes, I, I have finished, although my line has broke off. Over to you. Is there another element of the question? Uh, please, please, Margaret, speak up to the microphone. Eh? You are very. Sorry, my line I think is bad, sorry for this, but I think I've, I'm done. The criteria is country initiated. It's only when a country requests for support, that's when we come in. Thank you very much. Last, last take a comment from Lawrence, uh, Lauren, Lawrence Somme. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, These are uh, two questions, uh, uh, um, uh, one uh, to uh, uh, Suri and one to uh, 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 Margaret. Uh, starting with Margaret, I just wanted to, to find out how, um, what's the, 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 how relevant and how useful is it to have an Africa NDC hub, how that it uh, really helps the work that you 
you are doing at the, the NDC partnership uh, 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 level. That's the first one. The second, uh, my second question is to Suri. Uh, the MDS is still, uh, you know, uh, no, no approach uh, uh, that's not uh, accepted uh, by many parties, as you know, and coming from COP26, uh, we will recall that it did not make it to the final declaration, uh, MDS. As same thing for uh, the CBD COP, uh, 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 CBD uh, 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 COP15, uh, the, the Kunming uh, Declaration just had it as a footnote. So it means that there are some uh, advocacy work that is still needed to actually get parties to accept and understand, understand and accept the concept of uh, the MDS. What's um, my question then is to know what um, additional uh, advocacy work you think should be done actually to get those parties on, on, on board. Over to you, uh, Chair. Thank you, Chair, and uh, the panelists there. Yeah. yeah, let's start with Margaret, then we come to Suri. Okay, thank you so much. Um, thank you for the question. So the NDC have at the African uh, Development Bank, we are working closely. I might say that we are, like Africa Development Bank is a member to the partnership, but with the hub and the partnership, we work closely because the members of the hub are, the, are actually members of the partnership. For example, when it comes to NDC, uh, our focus of the partnership is the NDC uh, revision and implementation. When it comes to that, we share information uh, so that we don't duplicate. When we have uh, missions in countries and workshops, we actually do co-funding and uh, this together, we do missions, joint missions. For example, at COP26, we put together a paper on, on NDC revision, uh, ambition and climate financing flows which was launched in the Africa Union uh, Pavilion. So we really work closely. And maybe to add that the partnership goes beyond Africa as a region. So for us, we add in other regions, Pacific Asia and also the Caribbean. Uh, so we have four more regions that we add at, uh, 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 in the partnership. So we go beyond Africa, but we work closely in Africa. Thank you. Over to you, uh, Margaret. Thank you very much for that clarification, Suri. Thanks, Mohammed, and um, thanks, Laurent, for the question. Um, I, I would perhaps not look at it. Um, let me turn my camera on as well while I'm talking. Um, I, I would perhaps not look at it um, quite so 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 negatively. Um, I mean, as I, as I mentioned, um, there was quite strong wording in the Glasgow uh, Climate Pact um, outcome on um, restoration, uh, protect, uh, restoration, conservation, and protection of, of um, ecosystems, and, and recognizing also the um, the 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 benefits of, of of biodiversity protection. So while while maybe the particular wording. NBS was not um, included. Maybe it's considered to be more uh, precise to have a description of of, of what you of of what is meant. Um, and then also just to, to to remind as well the work that the standard Com standing committee on finance is doing um, on on nature based solutions. I think all of this is is already providing some some momentum in a way. Um, but um, the, the advocacy work that is necessary, maybe to, to, to build that momentum further and, and, and perhaps have the particular wording recognized at some stage would be to, to, to strengthen the, the evidence base for, for MBS potential and also the contribution it can make to, to the Paris Agreement. And, and I think in a way we're, we're, we're already seeing quite a lot of that because when you look to the NDCs, they have a lot of, inform, um, a lot of measures um, that can be labeled MBS or are explicitly labeled as MBS already in the NDCs. Um, 
Yeah, thank you, Lord. Thank you very much, uh, Suri. I uh, I agree with you. Maybe we we missed on the wording, but certainly there are a number of outcomes that uh, point to support for for nature-based solutions, especially the funding that goes into that area of nature-based solution and adaptation. Uh, do I see any other raised hand? If not, then we are we are doing good with time. We're just past the time. I think time we had one set. from Edward. One hand I up. don't see. Why is that, Edward? Hello, Edward. Go ahead, please. I didn't see your hand, but go ahead. He seems to have dropped off. Hello, Edward. One more chance, Edward. Yeah, seems to have dropped off. May I jump in with a question? So a quick question. I think this is uh, from Margaret. Um, I'm curious to hear about how the economic advisors that you've put out in African countries, are they pushing forward NBS? Um, how, how are they sort of trained on this area? Uh, to include it in the advisory work. It's really an excellent way to reach out to governments. It'd be interesting to hear more about how they're really integrating it into their work. Thanks. Um, can, I, can I come in? Okay. Sure, uh, go ahead, Margaret. Thank you so much, uh, John, for that question. So. These economic advisors, of course, they can't like set the agenda for countries. What they do uh, strictly, most countries, first of all, ask for quick, quick COVID-19 impact assessments on their economies, on their different sector. Others were specific on different sectors. But what is coming on board is that some elements of NBS is actually already aligned in the climate action that they are trying to, to mainstream in the economic recovery around water, around forestry, around agriculture. So it's very interesting that right now, the economic advisory that will come at the AU already started, as Leah has said, they will be looking at different pillars and the NBS pillar and biodiversity is going really to look at that. If it can, pull out some elements which economic uh, advisory plan, I mean economic plans have elements of NBS. Those could be a starting point. But in case there is any capacity enhancement, remember the economic advisors are not government officials, these are consultants. But in case of any capacity enhancement to governments, that could be the right channel training uh, consultants, but with, together with uh, officials, government officials, so that we have that capacity to promote NBS at ground level for prioritization and costing so that they are able to be able to attract funding. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you very much, Margaret. And uh, in the interest of time, I will want to first thank all of you for finding time to attend and uh, particularly the panelists. And at this point, I want to invite uh, John uh, Morgan, who is the research program manager for the Green Growth Knowledge Partnership and the co-chair of the NC4 ADF program, the National Capital for Africa Development Finance Program, uh, to give us the closing remarks. And that is the end of it. So go ahead, John. Thank you so much, Mohammed, and thank you everyone for joining today. It's really the start of a longer conversation in this series of webinars, uh, but we couldn't start from a more important place. Where do we go from now on with um, these dual challenges that we're facing, these combined challenges, as Leah uh, put it, and as Margaret also emphasized. Uh, we need, of course, to uh, recover um, from the debt crisis and from the health crisis after COVID, uh, but, the pre-existing challenges of the climate, of 
the biodiversity crisis. Uh, it, they haven't gone away and we can't forget about them. We can't uh, focus na narrowly on what is the most immediate, but uh, try to take this long-term perspective uh, that the programs we've seen today have really done a great job of, of making concrete for us. So I think um, some of the interesting points that at least came out for me today um, I, I quite liked the example, Suri, that you brought in uh, of the country level um, um, actions around natural uh, nature-based solutions in Sudan and Ethiopia um, that you mentioned. Um, those are the kinds of things I think all of us need to hear more about and learn more about, particularly to understand how they can help us recover better and in this longer term, greener way that all of us have been talking about today. Um, we've got to address some of those challenges that Siri mentioned, uh, that although we've made some great strides uh, in COP26 and in the country, um, country commitments, and in particular, the AU Green Recovery Action Plan uh, that Leah, Leah presented to us and the support from UNFCCC and uh, the um, NDC partnership for that. Um, how do we uh, increase still the climate finance that's, that's going to NBS from that 3% figure? Um, how do we continue to improve our ability to measure its impact, to understand the impact that MBS is going to have on the ground for these multiple, um, sometimes multiplying goals that all of us are, are uh, reaching out to countries to help uh, try to advance. Um, also excited about the examples that Margaret brought in, um, in the actions in Liberia, Burkina Faso, for example. Um, and the work that the NDC partnership is doing on economic advisory there. Um, really important. And from the Q&A, um, the mention that we, you know, how do we increase this advocacy? How can we get the word out there better? So I hope that we can take up some of those issues in the future. Um, we're going to continue this webinar series. And uh, we, the, the goal of the series is really to, you know, overall, as Vanessa said, to support the just and green recovery from COVID-19. But how do we do that? We want to strengthen the green recovery plans in Africa. We wanna do it through this webinar series by information sharing. We also uh, want to showcase how natural capital accounting and natural capital assessment approaches can help us build forward better. Uh, we also, of course, want to support the, the specific plans that are out there and, and making things happen. The, the green recovery action plan, The African Green Stimulus Plan, the facility, the new facility for recovery that Vanessa mentioned from the AFDB, and all the other support that's coming from countries and development finance institutions in Africa. How can we also build that great green wall for the Sahara and the Sahel Initiative uh, through natural capital and NBS approaches? Can we do that together? Can we strengthen the evidence base and investment in natural uh, nature-based solutions and in hybrid infrastructure uh, so both green and gray infrastructure as we build a stronger economy and a recovered economy in Africa. These are the things we're going to take forward in the webinar series. And um, we really couldn't do it, but without the partnership that we're building and, and we've seen so, such great partners here today with AFDB, AUC, UNFCCC and WWF through the Natural Capital for uh, African Development Finance Program that I co-chair together with uh, Vanessa at the HDB. Uh, we also have on board UNEP, GIZ, WRI, uh, UNEP, WCMC, the Africa Natural Capital Accounting Community of Practice with its secretary at the World Bank and the Economics for Nature Initiative, uh, which uh, includes the Green Economy Coalition and Capitals Coalition. I'm sure all of you have heard of some of these partners before. And just a, a quick word on GGKP. Um, not all of you may be familiar with us. So the Green Growth Knowledge Partnership is a consortium of 80 uh, organizations and thousands of experts in three different communities, policy, business, and finance. And we've launched three online platforms, the Green Policy, Green Finance, and Green Industry platforms uh, online to help manage uh, knowledge in these spaces. Um, I think in some, some areas of green growth, we've got some of the richest libraries um, in the world. Uh, I encourage you to check it out uh, if you're looking for information around green growth. 
um, in natural capital, nature-based solutions, but also in other areas, including the green recovery. So please do stay tuned to the webinar series. We're going to have our next installment early next year. And uh, we'll certainly be reaching out to all of you uh, when we've set it up and hope you can join us again. Thank you again uh, to all the panelists and distinguished speakers today for joining. And thank you uh, to all of you who have joined us and, and enriched the conversation today. Thank you very much. That is the end of the session. John has closed for us. And once again, thank you very much. And I look forward to seeing you uh, in the new year.